I'm going to show you how to configure VRO. Let's get started. Hi everyone, I'm Brian Watchers from Bavork. If this is your first time here and you want to learn about automating, programming, and monitoring in VMware environments, you're in the right place. Start now by subscribing and click the bell so that you don't miss a thing. In the previous video, we deployed the VRO appliance and powered it on. But we're not done yet, so let's head back to the lab environment. As you can see, we're right where we left off in the previous video. We've deployed the VRO virtual appliance, we've powered it on, and as I mentioned at the tail end of the previous video, we've given the VRO appliance enough time to fully boot up. Uh, I gave it about 10 or 15 minutes. You need to give your VRO server enough time to power up fully. So having done that, what are we going to do? Well, what we're going to do now is to perform the minimal amount of configuration I need to do in order to get VRO up and running to the point where I can actually use the VRO client to log in and perhaps start creating some workflows. So that's what we're going to do. I'll start by opening up a new tab in my browser. And in here, I'm going to go to https colon slash slash, and let's go to sa-vro-01.vclass.local. You'll recognize that FQDN from the previous video. sa-vro-01 is the host name of my VRO virtual appliance. So I'm just going to go to https FQDN and hit enter. And the first thing that I see here, uh, you won't necessarily see, but I am seeing this screen because I am currently using self-signed certificates. Now, if you're already familiar with self-signed certificates, you can ignore me for the next 30 seconds or so. But as I click advanced and proceed, what I'm doing here is bypassing a, um, a certificate that is what's known as a self-signed certificate. Self-signed certificates do encrypt traffic, but they're subject to something known as a man-in-the-middle attack. So one of the things that you would very seriously want to consider in a, a, an environment where security is of importance would be to replace the self-signed certificate that's installed by default with a certificate from an actual certificate authority, such as verisign.com, or perhaps you're running your own search certificate server internally. But certificates is a subject for a whole other discussion. So let's take a look at what we see here on the screen. Well, the first thing we see is, hey, there's that VRO client that Brian's mentioned before. Perhaps we should just click on start the orchestrator client. Well, you're going to be tempted to do that. But the first time you boot up your VRO uh, server, you need to first of all go into something called Control Center. By the way, the former name of Control Center uh, used to be called the Configurator. So you might sometimes hear people or see documentation using that, that old name. I'm just going to call it Control Center um, unless I lapse into uh, some old terminology. I will try to say Control Center from here on out. So before we go into the VRO client, we're going to click on this link here to start the Control Center utility. And as you can see, it's opened up another tab. And if you look at the URL, if you ever want to just type the URL to get into Control Center. You can just type fqdn slash vco dash control center. But uh, however you get to this point, you're going to be asked to authenticate. Now for Control Center, I'm going to authenticate as that super duper user account called root. This is the root account in the, the VRO appliance. This is the root account that whose password I configured during the deployment of the VRO OVA template. So I'm going to type the username root and my password, and I'll click the login button. And I'm now logged into Control Center. And as you can see, there are lots of different things you can do in here, including uh, installing new plugins or configuring logging. Or remember, I talked about changing the certificates. You can do so here. Uh, you can install your license. And again, lots of things. But I am attempting to show you the minimum that you need to to do in order to get up and running so that you can start creating orchestrator workflows. So the minimum thing that you're going to need to do in a standalone v, uh, VRO server is you got to configure its authentication provider. I'll explain what that means in a moment, but just before I do, if you are instead using the embedded v, 
um, VRO server, the one that's embedded into VRI's Automation 8, uh, you won't have to perform this step because the embedded VRO server gets its authentication provider automatically um, configured. In a embedded VRO 8 server, it's, it's configured automatically to authenticate against the the same mechanism that VRA8 itself is using. So let's ignore the embedded server. Again, during these uh, last few videos, we've been showing a standalone orchestrator server. So for a standalone orchestrator server, you're going to have to click on Configure Authentication Provider. And in here, it allows you different ways of authenticating users who are logging into the VRO client. We can choose LDAP, we can choose vSphere, we can choose VRI's automation. Again, I'm trying to keep the, the demonstration as simple as possible here to work for the maximum number of people out there in the world. So I'm going to choose vSphere. What this option in effect is saying is that when the VRO client authenticates a user, instead of having to configure a whole other LDAP server or, or install VRI's automation, I'm just going to use the SSO capabilities, the single sign-on capabilities of the vSphere environment that I already have. So I'll choose vSphere. And next it wants to know, um, well, where is your vSphere? Specifically, where's your vCenter server? Well, my vCenter server is called SA, Site A, VCSA, because it's the vCenter server appliance in this case, 01.vclass.local. So I'm going to click Connect. And the next thing it's going to do is connect to the, so, so the uh, control center is connected to the my vCenter server using HTTPS. And as a result, um, the control center has received back information from the certificate of the vCenter server, including specifically the fingerprint of the vCenter server. Now, if you're really security minded, what you should do is go to your vCenter server, look up what it says its fingerprint is, and then compare to what you see here. I'm not going to bother doing that. Uh, this is just my lab environment here. So uh, security is not of utmost importance. But if you were concerned about security, confirming that fingerprint and making certain that it's the correct fingerprint is what allows you to be certain that the control center and VRO itself is connected to the correct vCenter server. But for our video here, we're just going to simply choose to accept the certificate. As you can see, I've answered just about all of the questions that I need to in order to configure VRO to communicate with SSO. But there's one last setting, and it's this group admin field. What I'm about to do here is to specify one group of users that are going to be entitled to use Orchestrator. That one group in this case is going to be a group defined in SSO. If you're using some other authentication mechanism, you would define a group there. But since we're trying to make this work for everyone, I'm going to specify either an existing or a new group defined in SSO. Now, in order to do this, again, I could pick an existing group but what I'd rather do is show you how to create a new group because instead of uh, repurposing some group, I'd rather have a group that's just for orchestrator users and is a group that's not used for anything else. So I'm going to, go to open up a new tab and I'm going to log into the vSphere client. And in the vSphere client, I will go to the menu. And in here, I'm going to select administration. And as you can see, there are lots of different things that I can administer, but specifically, we need to go to single sign-on users and groups. And in users and groups, we're going to go to the groups tab. And as you can see here in SSO, we've defined a number of different groups already, but I want to add a new group. So I'll click add group. I'll give my group a name and a description. And then I need to add one or more users to this group. In this specific example here, I'm only going to add a single user. It's going to be a user that belongs to vSphere.local. And specifically, it's an account called 
administrator at vSphere.local. So administrator at vSphere.local is the one and only user that's authorized to use VRO currently. I can come back and change this later, but for now, let's add this new group. Then we'll go back to the uh, control center. So here in Orchestrator Control Center, I'm going to search for that newly created group. We'll click search to begin the search. And there's my new group. So I'll select my new group. Again, vSphere.local is the domain that the group's defined in, and it's specifically a group called VRO, and the only user in that group is administrator at vSphere.local. So this is all looking good. We're going to simply click Save Changes. Watch the screen real closely here. You may have noticed a message that just flashed by on the screen. Now that's a super important message. I'm not quite certain why it only uh, shows up for about three nanoseconds, but it's a super important message. So I'm going to do some video trickery here. I'm going to rewind the video and give you a chance to see that message again. So here we go. Let's start it again. Wait for it. Wait for it. And stop. So take a moment, if you would, to read the message. And um, as you can see reading the message, the when, when you make changes to configuration settings in Control Center, those changes are not immediately reflected by Orchestrator. Orchestrator will detect the changes in a few short moments, but we have to give it time to detect that changes have been made. So let's uh, kick back. I'll, I'll speed up the video a bit here so you don't have to wait the whole time, but let's give Orchestrator enough time so that it knows that changes have been made. As instructed, we've given Orchestrator enough time to detect the configuration changes that we made in Control Center. Let's attempt to log into the VRO client. To do so, we'll go back to this earlier tab where we have the Orchestrator client. If we click on the link labeled Start the Orchestrator Client, let's see what happens. Now, notice that we're getting a uh, service unavailable message, presumably status code 503 service unavailable. What's going on here is Orchestrator has picked up the fact that changes have been made, but Orchestrator is still in the process of implementing those changes. So the moral of the story here is when you make changes in Control Center, you really truly do, do need to give Orchestrator a little bit of time to not only detect that changes have been made, but to actually implement those configuration changes. So let's give Orchestrator a few more moments. Okay, I've given Orchestrator plenty of time. Uh, ab about five minutes has elapsed here, and even in my slower lab environment, that should be plenty of time for the change to have taken effect. So I'm gonna go ahead and close this tab where we failed to log in. We'll go back to this tab where we, once again, will click the link labeled Start the Orchestrator Client. And this time, as you can see, it's doing some redirection here, but it is successfully logging us into the VRO client. And now that we're in the VRO client, we can do all sorts of things, uh, such as working with workflows. In fact, why don't we take a quick peek as a little reward for our hard work We've, we download the software, we deployed the VRA appliance, we've configured the orchestrator server, so we ought to have a little reward here. So if we go to library workflows, you will notice that there are loads and loads of workflows. Each of these in this workflow folder called library, each of these folders corresponds to a different plugin in orchestrator. For instance, the vCenter plugin here has subfolders that allow us to do various things to items in the vSphere world, such as for our virtual machines, we could do things like power on, power off the, the machines in our environment. So all of these entries here with this icon are workflows, and uh, all of these icons obviously represent folders. Now, one of the reasons why I'm showing you these workflows is to emphasize that out of the box, VRealize Orchestrator has hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of workflows. 
they will reside in this folder called library. Think of the folder called library as the place where VMware and third-party companies are going to put their workflows. You should create your own folder in order to keep your workflows and the standard library workflows separate. Doing so is very simple. You just select workflows, click new workflow, and then create a workflow, give the workflow, excuse me, create a workflow folder, call the folder whatever you want, perhaps name it after your company or maybe use your own name. I'm going to choose to create a folder called Bavork. I'll click save. And now I have a folder in which I can put my workflows. Now, one last thing before we end the video here, I would also like to point out right from the get go that there are these three different buttons here that allow you to see workflows in three different ways, three different views. This first view allows you to see the workflows uh, as tiles or cards or whatever you want to call these square looking things. So each of these is a workflow and I can do things like I can run a workflow. Additionally, when you're in this view, this filtering mechanism allows you to search for workflows by name or if you use tagging, you can search by tag. There are lots of different ways you can search. We'll talk about the search capabilities in an upcoming video. So there's the tile view. The next view is the list view. And as you can see, the list view displays, here it comes, wait for it. The list view is going to, here we go, display all the workflows as a list. And if we scroll all the way down to the bottom, you'll notice that um, straight out of the box, we've got almost 500 workflows already predefined. And then this third view, the one that it went to by default, is the hierarchy view. Uh, notice, by the way, when you click the hierarchy view, it collapses the, the navigation bar over on the left. If you want to see that navigation bar again, you can uh, expand or collapse it by clicking on the Chevron button. But the hierarchy view is the traditional view for looking at orchestrator workflows. And as a beginner orchestrator developer, that hierarchy view is very likely to be the easiest view for you to work in. Again, we're going to look at all three views, but that'll come up in future videos. But for right now, if you've been following along and actually installing your vRealize Orchestrator server, congratulations, you've got it up and running. Keep watching the future videos and let's see how to create Orchestrator workflows. Join me in the next video where I'll show you how to log into the VRO client.